Hi, my name is Jack Aiello. Welcome to this Patient Empowerment Network program. Recently at a Myeloma 2017 meeting in Edinburgh, Scotland, a group of researchers and experts met to discuss new evidence, insights, and therapies in myeloma, and I'm pleased to be able to interview three of them today. Uh, Dr. Keith Stewart, he is Dean for Research and BASIC and Anna Maria Pollack, Professor of Cancer Research at Mayo Clinic in, in Arizona. Tom Martin, a professor at uh, UCSF, my hometown. And uh, shortly joining us will be Dr. Ola Langren, who is a professor myeloma expert at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Dr. Stewart, let me begin with you. Um, I looked at the agenda. I could tell this was a very scientific meeting, but I'd like to kind of ask you about the takeaways uh, for patients who will be viewing this uh, discussion. Specifically, I saw a, a tweet from you that said something like, good news for patients presented. Soon blood tests can replace bone marrow in many indications to monitor the disease. So can you talk more about liquid biopsies and how in the future we might not have to go through that wonderful bone marrow biopsy so often? Yes, thank you, Jack. We had about 100 um, of the leading myeloma scientists in the world descend in Edinburgh to discuss the science of multiple myeloma because there's probably the, the only meeting of the year that, in which we just focus on that more than we do on the clinical trial results. The very first session of the meeting was on an area that is uh, colloquially called liquid biopsy, scientifically called uh, cell-free DNA in the circulation. And this is a technology which allows us to pick up with great sensitivity circulating DNA, which is shed from cells in the body, including myeloma cells. It's become a revolutionary technology for cancer because it allows us to find traces of cancer in the bloodstream. Uh, and to monitor the levels of that over time without having to go into the body and do a deep biopsy such as with a bone marrow. So we had a very exciting session with five or six speakers who were all pushing the envelope on the sensitivity of this technique. And I came away from the session feeling that it wasn't going to be very long until we could begin to replace some of the bone marrows patients were subjected to with a simple blood test. I don't think it will be next year, but I predict it will be uh, becoming more and more common with each passing year. And I do believe at some point a bone marrow may only be necessary to make the diagnosis. So one of the things patients get from bone marrow these days are the fish and cytogenetics test to learn if they're high risk or not. That would also come from the uh, blood test? Well, actually, that's the part of the diagnosis that the, the blood tests focus on because it's measuring DNA and maybe RNA in the circulation. So specifically looking at the genetic abnormalities of the tumor, that's what they can detect with this technology. And they can also uh, detect the ty different types of myeloma and whether or not specific mutations in the cancer genetic mutations are present. So that's what the technology is specifically looking at. It can't tell you what percentage of cells in the bone marrow it can't, sell, it can't tell you uh, what's on the surface of the cells, but it does tell you that genetic um, evidence. And interestingly enough, there was a lot of discussion about the fact that when you take biopsies from myeloma patients from different places around the body, you get different genetic results. Yeah. And actually, the blood may be a better surrogate for that rather than doing three or four different pokes to find three or four different results. You may get all of that information in the circulation. Yeah, I don't know if my colleague Dr. Martin has any comments on that. Yeah, that was what I found the most interesting, that uh, the researchers from Arkansas showed when they took biopsies from both sides of the bone marrow, the iliac crest, and also when they took a biopsy from a plasma cytoma, they actually found different genetic results from each one of those areas. So if each one of those areas releases their DNA into the blood, the blood may actually be able to sum it all up, which is really nice. It'd be a great technique. Um, and the guys from Princess Margaret, um, you know, I think are trying to also be able to detect uh, the to total tumor burden by this blood test. Now that's going to be really a lot more challenging. And, um, you know, at the current time, they can take a couple blood tubes and do that. But, 
uh, they may need like a liter of blood to be able to tell exactly what the tumor burden is. So, so right now, I don't know, it might be an exchange of a liter of blood or a bone marrow. We'll see what the patients think on that one. Dr. Martin, let me stay with you because one of the other things today that the bone marrow biopsy is used for is MRD testing, minimum residual disease. So can you give patients an update on where we are with MRD testing? Is it strictly diagnostic? Can it be used to help guide treatment? Um, should patients be asking to get an MRD test? So, so that is a great question, Jack. And I think um, at this meeting, which is really, as Keith said, the best scientific meeting for us um, this every year, um, this is where most of the discussion and I think controversy and, and um, not really controversy, but most of the people were very involved in the discussion about MRD. And I think it, we came up with three conclusions. One, that it can be used as a prognostic marker and an endpoint, hopefully, for clinical trials, meaning that those patients that achieve MRD negativity are going to be the ones that are going to do the best because they have the deepest remission. Um, in terms of the type of test that we use for MRD, whether it's going to be flow cytometry or a DNA test, the fingerprint test, I like to say, of the plasma cells in the bone marrow, um, whether one's going to win over the other as the best test, it's hard to say at the current time. We have some people that favor flow and other centers that actually favor the genetic test. But we can detect by the genetic test, one in 10 to the six cells, and by the flow, at least one in 10 to the fifth, and in some places, 10 to the sixth. So we're really be, we're able to detect a very low burden of disease. And if so, if that test comes up zero, people have really a deep remission, and those patients are going to be the best. So hopefully we can use MRD as an endpoint to some of our clinical trials so that we don't have to follow pa patients so long for uh, how long their disease remains in remission or how long they survive after the treatment, but how long it takes to get to MRD negativity. Now, the other part of your question was, is can we use it to change therapies? So the big discussion, and it was a lively discussion, was, you know, if patients don't achieve uh, 10 to the minus, one in 10 to the minus six, what should we do? Should we switch treatments? And we didn't really come up at this point in time a conclusion of what we should do, but we decided that we should design clinical trials that if somebody doesn't reach 10 to the minus fifth or 10 to the minus six uh, MRD, then we should have patients either switching or not switching and see who does better. In addition, if they if patients get you know one and they have one cell in 10 to the minus fifth, we should then maybe take them off maintenance therapy. Half the group come off and half the group continue and see who continues in remission for longer. It's a great, um, for us, it's a great way to monitor patients when all their blood tests otherwise become negative. So should patients be asking to get an MRD test today? It's not really ready for prime time. I would say it's a discussion with your physician. Um, I think at the Mayo Clinic, they're following MRD. I think at UCSF, we're following MRD, but that's not all across the country. So discuss it with your physician. Some patients some patients and physicians will be comfortable and some won't be comfortable. So right now it's not quite ready for prime time. But if you achieve complete remission, it, I think it is possible to then do an MRD test. Dr. Langren, we talked a little bit about liquid biopsies and then MRD testing. Right. Um, I guess those are primarily on the diagnostic side. So one more area of diagnostic. Uh, could you talk about PET-CT scans and was there were there any updates there? And in particular... I thought I saw something where maybe they can be used in a prognostic uh, way. At our institution, we would do baseline, and we have not yet instituted doing it after a fixed number of cycles, but we have dis discussed a lot of maybe doing a PET-CT after four or six cycles or something like that. What we have been working on in our lab is to do immunopet, where we have uh, targeted uh, radio-labeled uh, we have antibodies, and we're also looking to see if you can use small molecules uh, to, to find the cells. Uh, I think that's a very exciting area, and uh, I don't know, are you working on that at Mayo uh, as well? Not really, uh, although we have some studies just opened actually using choline, which is a, a pet tracker for cancers that's already available for uh, prostate cancer. And we've just begun those studies. If people are interested, uh, when they come to see us, we, we sign them up for those. 
I don't know about UCSF, what, what you're doing there, Tom. We're actually trying to develop some scans for amyloidosis, but not specifically for myeloma. Dr. Martin, I want to start with you and open up a broad topic of RT therapy and checkpoint inhibitors and immunotherapies. I'm sure there was lots of discussion on them recently. CAR-Ts have been approved for a couple of um, blood cancers, not myeloma, in, in, in childhood cancers. Um, recently, there were some holes on checkpoint inhibitors. So from a patient's perspective, can you talk about where we are with CAR-T? Should patients be looking at trials these days and, and how excited or not excited you are by those kinds of treatments? Sure. Um, you know, in terms of immunotherapies, we have the antibody-based therapies, which we had some nice discussions of. Um, currently, we only have naked antibodies available, the CD38s and elotuzumab or the anti slam f 7 antibodies. Um, and we have next-generation antibodies that have dual binding sites that one site's going to bind to the tumor cell and the other site will bind to an immune cell and put the two together. Um, as well as we have some antibodies that have poisons attached to them where the antibody will bind to the myeloma cell and actually bring a targeted poison to the myeloma cell. Those are known as antibody drug conjugates. We're really starting these dual antibody targeted therapies and these ADCs uh, now and in the next year we'll have many studies that are open. These are really exciting and I think these are going to be much even much more exciting than naked antibodies. And then we have cellular therapies. So I think everybody's really excited about CAR T cells. Um, and I like to tell people, you know, the, the basis behind CAR T cells is we take out a patient's T cells, which I call the Marines, and in the test tube, we train the Marines to be professional myeloma fighters. We give them a gene that will track them directly to the myeloma cells. And when those T cells get to the myeloma cells, there's a signal inside the T cell that once it binds to that myeloma cell, really get active. And those cells are very um, good at actually fighting myeloma. In fact, one of the side effects is they fight it too well. And they have what's called cytokine storm, where you get so much activation of the immune system against myeloma, people's, people can have significant symptoms like fevers, low blood pressure, Sometimes they have so much tumor lysis, so much breakdown of myeloma, they can get kidney problems, uh, they can uh, need ICU care, and rarely they can get this um, swelling even in the, of the brain, a, a neurologic toxicity from all these cytokines. It's really quite interesting, in fact. But these side effects, um, we're, we're learning more and more about how to, how to treat these side effects. There's, four, there's really four trials that have been presented, and we discussed all of them at the meeting. And maybe, let's say, 50 patients have received these therapies. And all of those patients that receive therapy above the lowest level of T-cells, essentially all of the patients have had some response to the CAR T-cells. It's pretty dramatic at the current time. Uh, in the one specific one, the Bluebird study, uh, Above the lowest level of T-cells, 100% of the patients have responded. And most of the patients at the current time remain in response with no additional therapy after the infusion of the CAR T-cells. And just to give a time frame, is that six months, a year? What, how long? So okay. they've been followed between six months to a year and a half. So okay. some patients are out a year and a half for slightly longer. And so it's without any therapy, that's pretty exciting. I would say, you know, we're all, um, we all have a significant enthusiasm, but it's reserved by the fact that uh, we, uh, we don't really, I don't think it can be 100% for everybody, but right now it just looks so good. What do you guys think? I, I think one of the messages for patients is that um, we're still in the earliest days of this whole field. We still have a lot to learn. It's very difficult to find slots and trials. Uh, it's a very frustrating time, I think, for many physicians and their patients because we know there's some promise out there, but it's very hard to access right now. Um, there are other trials of things called bites, which are the same basic idea without the cells. Those will be much easier to get running and to put into practice. Um, in fact, one of the doctors at the meeting from Germany, Dr. 
Uh, Isola presented some data on a bite they had been using, which showed that three of the patients that he had treated had responded. And those trials are beginning to open around the United States as well. So I, I think it's going to take a little while till the scale is there that patients can routinely access this. But they're certainly going to, they're going to see a lot, hear a lot about this over the next 18 months to 24 months. Uh, we do think there will be a myeloma approval, uh, but I think the time frame is probably in that range. And, and just for clarification, bites are that an off-the-shelf type drug that uh, can... Bites are uh, off-the-shelf. Uh, uh, they're like the... T Tom used a nice analogy of the Marines are trained. That it's the same basic technology without the cells to carry them to the tumor. They're probably not going to be as dramatically effective as the CAR-T, but they basically work around the same concept. So it and matches up the T-cells to the tumors? They, they, uh, they lead the T-cells to the tumor and tell them to get busy. Uh, yeah, cool. Dr. Langren, any follow-up comments on that one? No, I share those exact perspectives. Uh, at our program, we uh, also we have the CAR T cells going. Uh, we are trying to do mod modifications of them. We have the armored CAR T cells that do release factors that make them uh, more active, and we are trying to also see combining them with different types of drugs. Um, we also have the bites coming, and we also have the antibody conjugates. I think the field overall is going very fast, as both uh, Tom and Keith said. I also think that there will probably be a myeloma CAR T cell therapy approved in the in the time window. I think Keith said 18 months. I, I think I would agree with that. And can you follow up by enlightening us as to what's going on with checkpoint inhibitors? So for right now, uh, the checkpoint inhibitors uh, are currently uh, on the hold uh, after the Merck studies uh, were found to have an excess of deaths. And this was, uh, uh, the first trial was the uh, relapse refractory patient population with pembrolizumab with uh, pomalidomide dexamethasone versus pomalidomide and dexamethasone. And the other study was for the newly diagnosed patients with revlimid and dexamethasone with pembrolizumab versus revlimid and dexamethasone. Both those two trials uh, were found to have an excess rate of patients dying. Uh, and these studies had not a very long follow-up. Uh, this happened in the time window uh, around 6 to 12 months for both the trials. Uh, the two st studies were stopped and the FDA investigated and then they were completely closed. So patients had to go off the trials. Uh, the data has been disclosed publicly uh, by the FDA and the Merck Corporation. Uh, and looking through the publicly available information, uh, there is really no uh, clear uh, information on the causes of death. Uh, there is really no uh, striking pattern what's going on. Uh, but the two trials show that there is an excess death for the experimental arm in these two trials in combination with IMITS. As a consequence, the FDA went back and uh, they made an internal decision uh, to put all trials for myeloma with a checkpoint inhibitor on hold. And uh, all sponsors have been told that uh, they cannot enroll patients on these trials unless there is a justification. So I think that probably what can happen is that there could be trials with checkpoint inhibitors that could either be newly opened or they could reopen. If they target patient populations that are refractory to virtually every other known drug, that that could be a rationale. There is scientific rationale to consider it, but I think in the current landscape with all the, the other options, it's hard to justify having trials going uh, when there is this uh, signal from these trials. Uh, but I think we don't really understand what's going on, so there could be patients that could benefit from it, and given that there is scientific rationale, um, continuing to develop trials for people who are refractory to all the other drugs, I think it would make sense. That would be my, my bias. I'm, I'm happy to hear what Keith and Tom think. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. So these drugs, they clearly have activity in myeloma. And the question is, what is going to be the best partners for these drugs? It may not be IMIDS. 
It may be some that we have to partner them with other drugs and maybe other antibody based therapies, maybe a, a checkpoint inhibitor plus a CD38 in, uh, uh, medication, or even a checkpoint inhibitor plus a CAR T cell or a checkpoint inhibitor plus a bite. These are the things that I think we will um, investigate over the next one to five years. And I think they will find a place in myeloma. We just have to do it safely. So let me ask you all one final question. Dr. Stewart, I'll start with you. And it's the same question for all of you. And that is, can you, what, what, what are the one or two really important patient takeaways for treating their myeloma? Well, I think we've just been talking about what uh, has the field galvanized and excited, which is the whole field of immunotherapy. That's clearly the future. Yeah. Um, it's coming fast. Uh, my best advice for patients is, uh, you know, keep taking the best drugs you can because the longer you stay in remission and you know, the better you're doing, the more likely you are to be able to benefit from these um, potentially transformative therapies. Uh, we also got quite excited at the meeting by um, some of the precision therapy opportunities, such as the drug Venetoclax, which is proving to be spectacularly good in, in some 15 to 20% of myeloma patients who have a specific genetic change. Um, we're, we're quite excited about that, that therapeutic as well. There is a group of, and the final point I'd make is that, that we didn't talk about here is we struggled a little bit in our field to define the patients of myeloma who have the most need the, uh, the highest risk patients. And I think we made some progress towards that at the meeting in redefining those patients and, and um, maybe treating them differently than we do the, the vast majority of a more slow growing disease. So I think those were the, the take homes for me. Dr. Langren, same question, but I know you've done a lot of studies with MGUS and smoldering patients. So anything out of the meeting for uh, patients diagnosed at those levels in terms of early treatment, possibly curative treatments, things like that? I know there was some uh, data on the, the criteria for initiating treatment. Uh, there was a discussion whether the free light chain ratios of 100 should be, should be used for initiation of treatment, which is in the new uh, or the guideline from 2014 that Visa Rashmar uh, and others uh, wrote. I think uh, I think the data from the literature, though, suggests that uh, early initiation of, of therapy translates into deeper and probably higher rates of deep responses. But the big question is, of course, whether that translates into longer overall survival. That's going to be very hard to prove. I think uh, my bias when I review the literature is that if there are new drugs uh, that are less toxic, which we already have, and there will be more of them, it would make sense to try to catch the disease uh, before it starts causing too many problems. Uh, and I think that feeds into what Keith just said, that for patients who are diagnosed with myeloma today to use the best drugs, uh, and that doesn't necessarily have to mean that they have to be very toxic, but to use those and keep the disease away so it doesn't become active, I think the extension of that statement is that if we even could catch it slightly earlier, then maybe that benefit could be longer. Of course, you don't want to treat patients with MGUS who will never get sick. That would be wrong. But there is probably a window somewhere between the smoldering myeloma and the current multiple myeloma where there could be need to, to initiate treatment. So I think the field is going to go, in my opinion, in that direction with better imaging, better molecular profiling, uh, and to monitor the disease uh, response with MRD or imaging, however we do that. Uh, that's what I think is going to happen. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Martin, uh, final takeaways? Yeah, I would say for patients that, you know, we currently have some uh, really good drugs to treat myeloma with Revlimid, Pomalist, uh, Velcade, Kyprolis, Elutuzumab, or Implicity, and Darzalex. Those com combinations of those drugs can really uh, put patients in remission for a prolonged period of time. However, when those drugs stop working, we have great clinical trials with new drugs and new immunotherapies. And so my recommendation for patients is 
you know, go to your local referral center, look for a clinical trial. Some of the next generation of bites, antibody drug conjugates, targeted therapies, like Keith was saying, these also have tremendous uh, capabilities and potential, and we're excited about all of them. You know, at the current time, not everybody can get on a CAR T trial just because of limited access, but there's plenty of other good options to for clinical trials. So keep working. And my suggestion for patients is always to get a second opinion from experts like these, Dr. Stewart, Dr. Martin, Dr. Langren. Thank you so much for being here and being part of this. Uh, my name is Jack Aiello. Thank you again for watching this PEN program.